A walk through the presence process is a retreat by Michael Brown, brought to you by Namaste Publishing Incorporated. Track one. Once upon a time, there was a king, and he had a servant who was always by his side, and so they became best friends. And he thought the servant was kind of cute because the servant, he thought he was kind of simple actually, because the servant always said, it's all good. No matter what happened, he always said, it's all good. One day they went hunting, and the servant and the king were chatting away, and while they were chatting distractedly, the servant put too much gunpowder into the gun. And as the king took a shot, he blasted off his thumb, and went, "Uh uh-oh. And the servant said, no, it's all good. And the king said, it's not all good. (laughs) You cannot blow the king's thumb off. (laughs) Said, I'm going to have to punish you in some way, because we just can't have, you know, if we allow people to start blowing the king's thumb off, you know, things will get out of hand in the kingdom. So we have to set an example here. So the king called a court of law, and the servant was tried and found to be distracted (laughs) and sentenced to six years of imprisonment. And the servant on sentencing, they said, we are sentencing you to six years of imprisonment. And the servant said, it's all good. It's all good. And the king felt rather badly about that. About a year later, the king decided to go on a journey beyond the confines of his kingdom. So he took some troops, some supplies, some people to carry the supplies. And off he went beyond the confines of his kingdom into a place he'd never been before. Now, this was the kingdom of cannibals. And so they were duly captured by cannibals. And the cannibals were really pleased to have captured so many people and decided to have a banquet. So they brought out all their cauldrons and they started bubbling the water and the people were duly tied on ropes. You know, it wasn't just about eating the food, it was about cooking the food, right? So people were gradually, slowly lowered into the cauldron and the, the delicacy was in proportion to the screaming and all sorts of things. But as the king was being lowered, the cannibals noticed that he didn't have a thumb. And they said, stop, we do not eat imperfect food. So the king was untied and they told him to leave because he was imperfect. So while he was walking naked back to his kingdom, (laughs) the king had a lot to think about. And one of the things he thought about was the fact that his servant had now been in prison for a year for doing something that had actually saved his life. So he went and he said, I'm going to pardon the servant. And he went to the servant and he said, I'm letting you go, but I'm so sorry that you have been in prison for a year. And the servant said, it's all good, it's all good. He said, how can it be good? He said, well, if I wasn't in prison, I would have been with you on that trip. (laughs) So that has nothing to do with what we're talking about here tonight. (laughs) But it's all good. (laughs) There is a pathway that we all use that our awareness travels along as we enter our experience of this world, which in the presence process we call the pathway of awareness. And we use this pathway every day of our lives without even realizing it. We're actually unconscious to it until we're made conscious of it. And this pathway can be best seen by observing a child as it enters the world. A child first cries, is emotional, then begins to communicate, and then becomes a physically independent being. So a child doesn't pop out the womb and start walking around and then speaking and then crying. There's a specific order in which this occurs, a specific way the awareness moves through. And it's from emotional to mental to physical. Now, this pathway can be seen in a larger way in the world, and the world acknowledges this pathway in which we can call the seven-year cycle. And so for the first seven years we're in the world, we are emotional beings. We're called children. Then at around seven years, we enter some sort of schooling, and we get very into mental activity about communicating, reading, writing. And then around 14, we go through what's called puberty. We go through a physical transformation in our bodies, or more likely a physical activation. And we suddenly become very aware of the physical world and our place in it. And that continues until we're 21, and then we have a big party because we've arrived. It's our 21st. So this cycle is again going from emotional to mental to physical. Now, there was a time when we were not completely disconnected from nature or the natural cycles of the world, when we would acknowledge this pathway. So when a child was born, it would be given a name, and then after about seven years on this earth, it would be given another name. And then after another seven years, it would be given another name, and then around 21, it would be given its final name because we knew that that being was going to go through certain changes, and the name would reflect that. Not only that, but at those naming periods, we would do rites of passage to acknowledge that there was a change. And so the child's activity or situation within the community would change. 
So up until seven, the child was allowed to run free and be spontaneous. And then at seven years old, the child was required to start doing certain activities. And then at 14, the activities were changed. There were responsibilities added. And then at 21, the child, the being, was required to now take their place in the community. We don't have rites of passage anymore although we still go through them. That's what the 21st birthday party is now. It's an unconscious rite of passage. And even you will see that teenagers today, at some point they'll begin tattooing and piercing and all sorts of things. That again is a rite of passage. Because often the rite of passage involved marking the body. So once we enter the physical aspect of our experience, which is around 14, we mark our body. We're entering a body experience, a physical experience. So this pathway of awareness actually begins in the womb. It begins as what we may call vibrational awareness. What is happening to us as we come in and go through these cycles, which is not apparent to us when we live in a time-based paradigm, is we're going through an experience of imprinting. And imprinting works like this. When the child is in the womb, and the child enters the womb around two months into pregnancy, so the child is in the womb for roughly seven months. So the vehicle is first prepared, the consciousness enters. So the seven-year cycle begins in the womb as a seven-month period. While we are in the womb, whatever happens to our mother, whatever experience our mother goes through, whatever is happening around her in her experience will be accurately reflected in her body. If, for example, while I'm in the womb, my mother goes through a traumatic experience, that traumatic experience will be directly reflected in the way that my mother's blood is pumping, in the way that she's breathing, in the way that the heart is beating, in the body temperature, in the way that she's moving her body, in the way she is speaking. Everything about her will reflect that. And for me, being in the womb as consciousness, I will experience that vibrationally. They will just come to me as vibrations because all of those things are vibrations in the body. Then, as I am born into this world and I enter the emotional, my experience is that of energy in motion. To a child, everything is moving. I don't know if you've watched a child. Everything's moving because they can't name it. We only name something when it matters. And the moment we name something, it does matter. In other words, it becomes material. And usually the first thing we name is our mother. That's the first thing that really matters to us. And matter and mother are actually the same word. So until something matters to me, and until it materializes, it moves, like energy in motion. And my experience of the world is that of being in an energetic field. And whatever happens in that energetic field is imprinted on what I would call my energy in motion body, my emotion body, my emotions. And then when I enter schooling or increased mental activity at around the age of seven, I then start to learn language. And language is magic, is what it is. I don't know if you're aware of that. When we go to school, we get taught magic. The first thing we do is we're taught how to spell words. <laughs> because words are the roots of all spells. <laughs> And once we can spell words, we learn to put them in sentences. <laughs> now once we learn those sentences, they sentence us. Once we learn sentences, then we can get told stories. And it's usually his story that we get told. And his story is always the story of the winner. The winner always writes his story. And the winner always lies. <laughs> anyway, that's beside the point. The fact is, we start converting our energetic emotional experience into a conceptual one. We create our belief systems about ourselves and the world we're in. Then around 14, we suddenly become very physically aware of the world and physically aware of ourselves. And you can see this transition happen in children as they move into being teenagers. Before the transition, we see someone kissing, we go, ugh. After the transition, we see someone kissing and we go, what's that about? <laughs> Complete change. And then we turn 21, and by the time we turn 21, we are literally trance-fixed by the physical world. We are in a trance, and it is fixed upon the physical, through which we interact mentally. Now what's happening as we're going through this cycle, which is initially hard for us to see, is that we are being imprinted with information, and information is to assist us to move in formation. We're being printed with information that carries our life destiny, or what we're here to do, or maybe in the East they would call it karma. Now you deal with your karma, you get much karma. So we're being printed with our destiny. 
And the way it looks is like this. If at eight months into pregnancy, my mother and father have a fight, and he says, I've had enough of this, I'm walking out, and he abandons her. And she goes through abandonment, and he's angry. That vibration is imprinted into the vibrational body, into my vibrational body. Then what will happen is that almost exactly seven years later, say when I'm six years old, maybe at that point my mother and father will actually get divorced and he will leave for good. And my mother will go through abandonment and he'll be all angry and she'll be all hurt. But this time that experience will be an emotional one to me. It will imprint my emotional body with a particular pattern of energy in motion, a particular way my energy works, moves. Then, say at 13 years old, seven years later, I have a best friend in the neighborhood who I'm very attached to, and suddenly my best friend and their family move out of the neighborhood, and I will go through an experience of abandonment and maybe even anger about it. But this time, I will experience that conceptually. In other words, as a result of that experience, I will tell myself things about myself and about the world I live in. And then, say at 20 years old, exactly seven years later, I'm deeply in love, I'm engaged, I'm going to get married, and the day before, she just runs out on me. Now, my attention, my awareness will be in a very physical place. It'll be about her, what she's doing, about the wedding that's been messed up, about the events, in a very physical place. But what is not immediately seen is that it's the exact same event occurring over and over again. Why it looks different to us is because by the time we're 21, we are physically transfixed by this world. And most of our attention is on the physical. And the thing about the physical is it has this sleight of hand in which it can change all the time. In fact, it does. The physical is changing all the time. So every time something happens to me, it looks like something new, right? It's a different event, different circumstance, something new. But if I go down deeper, if I allow myself to sink into my emotional body, into the feeling, what I will discover is that the feeling when I got ditched at the altar and the feeling when my best friend left the neighborhood and the feeling when my parents got divorced is identical. So really nothing's changed. It's a repeating cycle. And by the time I'm 21, whatever that dysfunction is, from this point of view, we can call it a dysfunction. From another point of view, we can call it a gift, but we've got to get to that point of view first. But from this point of view, we call it a dysfunction. But that dysfunction has now been imprinted vibrationally into my vibrational body. It's been imprinted emotionally into my emotional body. It's been imprinted mentally into my mental body. And it's been imprinted physically into my physical awareness, into my physical body and into my physical circumstances. So now I can work with it. I know where it is I can work with it. We don't look at it like that. But a lot of people will say, oh, it's my karma. I'm having a hard time because it's my karma. But if you ask them, where is your karma? This karma that's happening to you, where is the karma? Where is the karma? It's actually stored within our body as an imprinted pattern. Now what happens is that seven year cycle continues and continues every seven years. By 28, I'm supposed to have qualified at something and met the person I'm gonna marry. By 35, I'm supposed to be married, a couple of kids, getting on in the job. And so it goes on. There are these cyclic expectations. And if I look at each seven year cycle, what I will realize is that the same thing has been happening over and over and over again. But in order to see that, I have to be able to look not with these eyes, nor with the eyes of the head, the mental, but with the eyes of the heart. And the eyes of the heart will tell me something's going on because I will say things like, why does this always keep happening to me? Right? You've heard that. You've heard yourself say it too, probably. So by the time we are adults, we are operating in the world in a particular way. Because we are transfixed by the world, we believe that the physical world is the cause of what's going on. We behave that way. The world behaves that way. Our parents behave that way. Our politicians behave that way. Business people behave that way. Doctors behave that way. Everyone behaves that way, that the physical world is the cause. For example, it works like this. I have this pen in my hand. If I throw this pen across the room, what the world's example tells me is that if I want to change the way I'm throwing that pen, I need to move it around over here on the floor if I want to change the way I'm throwing it. In other words, if I don't like my job, then I need to get another job. If I don't like my partner, I need to find another relationship. If I don't like the country I'm living in, I need to move somewhere else. And so I do that, but we know what happens. Three months into the new position or into the new relationship, or once I've bought the property, settled down, and this is the place, the same stuff starts to happen. But we don't recognize it because we're looking at the physical world. 
but it begins to get uncomfortable again, although it's different people I'm working with, a different relationship, different neighborhood that I'm in, but the same discomfort starts to arise. We can't see it though because the discomfort is stored in the emotional body. The emotional body is the causal point of our experience while we're in this world. So what do I mean by that? If I want peace, there's three ways I can go about it. I can tell you all to sit still and shut up. <laughs> That's what our politicians do, right? Or I can behave like the UN. If I want peace, I can go, well, let's, let's talk about it. Let's talk about peace. Let's get together and talk about peace. <laughs> but that's not going to give me peace either, right? Because I'm never going to be at peace until I feel at peace, because peace is a feeling. It's not a mental concept, and nor is it a physical circumstance. The feeling is the causal point of my experience. Why? Because of the pathway of awareness. Actually, the causal point of my experience is this area here, the vibrational. But as yet, none of us speak vibrational. Does anyone here speak vibrational? Because <laughs> I need a few lessons. <laughs> okay, so we do speak the language of the emotional body. That's the language of feeling, to feel. We do speak the language of the mental body. That's thinking, understanding, and when we analyze, which is one of my favorite words. <laughs> And we do speak the language of the physical body, which is sensation. So if we want to go to the causal point of our experience and adjust that, unless we adjust the feeling content, we never have any success. So many of us have tried that. For example, if we have something physical going on, we'll go and move the pen around on the floor. For example, if I have a sickness that's causing me symptoms, and symptom is also an interesting word. Symptom means some time, symptom, piece of time that's unintegrated in my emotional body. And normally when I'm dealing only with symptoms, because there's times when I need to deal with symptoms. If I'm about to lose this physical body, I better go and deal with those symptoms. But if I only deal with the symptoms, what I'm normally going to be doing is sedating or controlling something. And whatever it is, it'll pop up somewhere else. It'll Push it down here and I'll pop over there. <laughs> Push it down here and pop over there. Maybe I can go a bit deeper than that and I can deal with what's going on to me mentally. Talk to somebody about it. Talk, talk, and talk, and talk, and talk, and talk. And it can cost me a lot of money to talk and talk and talk and talk. So I can go and do that too, which is helpful. But unless I go to the emotional body, which is the causal point of my experience, and feel what's going on, I'm going to have no success. Now the thing about the emotional body, because it's the place we were until we were seven, a good metaphor for the emotional body is a child, is that it's a child. And it's funny, if you ask people what they're feeling, they will go, I'm feeling betrayed. Betrayed is not a feeling. It's not a word a child would use. Mm. Betrayed is an adult concept. No child who's having an upset goes, I just feel betrayed. <laughs> So what happens is, at some point, emotional body awareness gets shut off. And we think we can feel, but really what we're calling feeling is drama. Drama that we conceptualize. So if we want to make any changes in our experience, our job is to, to go to the causal point of the experience. And to do that is to be able to feel. Now the feeling body is, works very simply. If I'm standing with my eyes closed and I fall forwards and I hit the ground, hitting the ground is a symptom, a physical symptom. And if you try that, you'll find it's a very physical symptom. It's a symptom of not being able to feel that I'm out of balance. Simply that. Now if I reinstall the ability to feel, just simply that, and I feel how out of balance I am, just through feeling I bring myself back into balance. Just through feeling. There's no thinking required. I don't have to go, I'm 16 degrees out of balance, I've been this way for 4.5 days, and now I'm going to come back 2.5 degrees per minute and then end up at 0 degrees. If I go into that place, which is the mental place, then I will fall over. So feeling is healing. The only thing is that our emotional body awareness has been shut down. We don't function in this world through felt perception. If we do, we couldn't do half the things we did. What felt perception is, is functioning from the heart center. In other words, it's being able to feel the consequences of my thoughts, words, and deeds before I even put them into action. Now, if I can feel the consequences of my thoughts, words, and deeds before I even put them into play, I don't need anyone to tell me how to behave. I don't even need any law. Where there is love, there is no law. Because my own feelings will guide my behavior. Because I won't want to do things that hurt myself. What the presence process is, it's a procedure, it's a process that we use to re-enter our emotional body awareness. And just like there is a pathway that we use to enter this experience of the world, there is a pathway that we use to return back to operating from the causal point of this experience. 
If we're operating from the physical and we're interacting with that mentally, the world has no meaning. It's absolute chaos. And we go into what's called ineffectual behavior because all we're doing is meddling with an effect. The physical world is just an effect. So in order to re-enter emotional body awareness, to enter the causal point of our experience, we have to reverse the pathway of awareness that we use to enter the world. And a child knows this. We also experience this when we do any spiritual practice. So for example, a child will first adopt a physical posture, and then a child will say words like, Dear God, won't you ask Daddy just to play with me sometimes when he comes home from work and not maybe just shout at Mom all the time? Something like that. And if we listen to those words, it'll move emotion, it'll move energy, emotion. So it's going from physical to mental to emotional. And once we enter the emotional, we start to feel and it's through the feeling that we re-enter vibrational awareness. So we also have this experience when we go and learn to meditate. When we go and learn to meditate, we're first taught a physical posture, whatever it might be. Then once we get the physical posture, we get taught a mantra, a mental thing. Say this and it will help you get to where you want to go. Home, home. Okay. And then from saying that enough, it will bring up love and devotion in you. And when the love and devotion comes, that feeling will move you into having the experience you're looking for. So there's a specific pathway of awareness that we move through. Now what happens is, once we've closed off our emotional body awareness, once we have no emotional body awareness, we can no longer see that the uncomfortable physical circumstances in our world and even the confusing mental processes we're going through are being caused by an uncomfortable condition in our emotional body. We're completely unaware of that. How can we be? We don't have any emotional body awareness. So what we do is then we normally go to a spiritual experience as a reaction to what's happening in our lives instead of as a response to God. In other words, we go into a spiritual experience by running away from where we are. And we wonder why we don't have any results. Wonder why we can meditate for years and really, don't worry, it'll happen when you die. <laughs> because a child that only goes to a parent out of fear doesn't create much of a relationship with the parent. It's very hard to have any sort of relationship. So because we're going to our spiritual experience or trying to become authentic or whatever we might call it, trying to get to know myself or whatever I'm trying to do as a reaction because I'm so uncomfortable in my life, there's so much of comfort going on and I can't feel it. So I'm going to go and try and do something as a reaction to it. So what we'll do is we'll adopt the physical practice. We'll read a lot of books about it, lots of books. Our bookshelves are full of the books. And then we'll go and sit in um, some spiritual place and do stuff. So we'll miss out a step completely. And that's why we have so many body, mind, and spirit organizations. <laughs> okay, no one wants to go near that heart. But going through the heart is a rite of passage that separates the wheat from the chaff. Going through the heart is essential because the grief, anger and fear, and those are the only three emotional dysfunctions we need to concern ourselves with. We might have a lot of names for emotions, but if you ask a child how they're feeling, they'll either be sad, scared, frightened or cross, angry. There's no other feelings going on there. And the reason for that is the dysfunctional emotional resonance of the physical body is always fear. Fear is always about our physicality. The dysfunctional emotional resonance of the mental body is always related to anger. In other words, revenge is a plot. And the causal emotional dysfunctional point related directly to the emotional body is grief. So if we come into this world being unconditional beings as we are, and we enter this conditional experience, you can bet that we all have fear, anger, and grief. And that is causing discomfort in the body. And we're resisting the awareness of these feelings because they're uncomfortable. And so we'll go into behaviors that are sedation and control behaviors. So, for example, society allows sedation and control because society really doesn't know what to do about this condition. And it's actually soci not society's job to do anything about it. But so things are allowed. For example, smoking cigarettes is control. When I'm feeling out of control and I don't know what to do, I'll have a cigarette because now I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm having a cigarette. Now everything's okay. Or sedation. When this energy is coming up that's uncomfortable for me, I'll just have a drink and so it's sedation. And then, of course, the most elusive one of all is marijuana. Marijuana is both sedation and control. Marijuana smokers, and I used to be one, marijuana smokers are very cool and laid back. <laughs> World peace, man, I tell you. World peace, I'm all for world peace. I think I heard your greed peace, eh? especially the greed peace. I believe in greed peace. But if you take their stash away. <laughs> Who took my stash? <laughs> Who took my stash? <laughs>
<laughs> Marijuana smokers are the angriest people you're ever going to meet. Right? <laughs> and that's why it's such a seductive self-medicating tool, because it really is all about self-medication. So what we do is we do anything to avoid what, what we're really feeling. We'll even go and join a spiritual path and give ourselves funny Indian names. <laughs> I've been thinking of giving myself one, by the way. <laughs> Sri Barbie Bungo. <laughs> and I'm going to channel Michael Brown. <laughs> Because I want to be more authentic. <laughs> so we'll do stuff that, like that as a reaction. In other words, we'll leave the life experience we're in, what we're given, and we'll go over here and go, I'm going to try and be more authentic. I'm going to go to God as a reaction to my life, and I think I'm going to get somewhere. The heart center is a rite of passage. The fear, anger, and grief, because it's not really fear, anger, and grief. We've called it that. It's energy that is not in motion, blocked emotions. And all blocked emotions, all they really are is heat, because a blocked emotion is an energy that's in resistance, which is caused by reactive behavior, the development of reactive behavior. And when anything's in resistance, it creates heat, and that heat becomes very energetically uncomfortable. And then I will call that heat fear, anger or grief, depending on how I experience it. If I experience it in the physical, I will call it fear. If I experience it in the mental, I will call it anger. If I experience it deeply emotionally, I will call it grief. But it's just energy that's blocked. So what I do is I run from it. My whole life is about running from it. In fact, my run from it is called the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> and the pursuit of happiness is about happenings. So happiness is about happenings. Happiness is based on something happening, right? Something's got to happen for me to be happy. Something's got to happen and something else mustn't happen. And if I can make that happen and stop that from happening, I'm going to be happy. But in order for me to be happy, I'm going to have to keep that happening and stop that from ever happening. <laughs> and the whole thing about the physical world, because that's where I'm going to seek my happiness with stuff, is that the physical world is always changing. So I can be sure that in my pursuit of happiness is going to make me very unhappy. <laughs> Not only that, but what I'm really running away from is a part of myself that I don't want to feel, part of my energy system that I don't want to feel. So I'm running away from myself towards some illusion of feeling good. And what happens is in my emotional body forms a split in which a conflict starts to happen. I'm looking for one emotion and I'm running away from another. And because the emotional body is the causal point of my experience, that split will come out in my thoughts, conflict and thinking. And then it'll come out as physical things in my world, good things and bad things. Keep away from the bad things and I'll call them the devil and bad and whatever. And I'll go towards the good. And I'll call that God. And now I'm in conflict. I'm in a world of separation and conflict. All because I'm running away from something inside of myself that I don't want to feel. And that's when I go and join a spiritual path or go into some practice. So the journey is about feeling. If I want to re-enter an experience of authenticity, I can't re-enter authenticity by entering an inauthentic experience. In other words, something that's not already happening in my life. I can't go, no, okay, I'm going to go here and do these strange things and so that I can become authentic. It doesn't make any sense, right? If I want to be authentic and fear, anger, and grief are what is really authentic about my experience, then I better start to feel the fear, anger, and grief. If I'm afraid, then the most authentic thing about me is my fear. And it's by entering that experience, by allowing that to be there, that I pass through the doorway into authenticity. So a strange thing happens when I allow myself to feel my fear, is that I allow myself to feel. And by allowing myself to feel, I reawaken my emotional body awareness. I allow myself to begin learning a vocabulary of feeling, a vocabulary which I stopped speaking, the language of feeling. And when I allow myself to learn this vocabulary, and I become okay with the idea of feeling what's going on with me, with feeling my anger, because it's, there's fear, anger, and grief. And the reason why I normally run away from my fear is because I'm afraid of my fear. It's not about the fear itself. I'm afraid of the fear. But if I allow myself to feel my fear, I will realize that the thing that I'm most afraid of, that I'm most afraid of, is my own anger. Because if I allowed myself, I think, because you remember anger is about the mental, I think that if I allowed myself to be as angry as I really feel, I will destroy everything. And when I allow myself to move through the fear and sink into the anger and feel the anger, I will realize that what I'm most angry about is that I had my heart broken. So if I allow myself to sink into my anger, and just really sink into it, I'm going to move into my grief. 
And the grief will lead me to a point of release. In other words, the tears will allow that energy as the tears come. And not tears and group crying. I don't know if any of you have done the group crying. Let's get together and cry together. We'll see if your crying is any better than mine today. I've really had a hard life. <laughs> it's really, really, very, very hard this week. <laughs> well, that doesn't work. If I allow myself to cry, because if I'm really going to get to the crying, to the grief, I will get to a point where I'm crying for no reason at all. If I'm crying and going, it was really when my father took away my t- toy at five, then you can be sure I'm crying in the mental plane. I'm really not emotional yet, because my original experiences where that emotion is coming from have no concepts tied to them, and no amount of conceptualization can take me into that place. I have to let go of all the mental stuff in order to really get in there. So when I'm lying on the couch and I've gone through half a box of tissues and I am sobbing and I have no idea why, I'm on the right track. But the thing about this is I don't want to go into that place. I don't want to deal with my heart as a reaction. In other words, I don't want to go and deal with my fear because I'm afraid of what will happen if I don't. Because there's no way of taking fear to fear and thinking you're going to accomplish anything. Nor am, must I go and deal with my anger because I'm getting really annoyed with my reactive behavior. So I'm going to go and deal with my anger now. That's not going to work either. Nor should I deal with my grief because, you know, all this crying is just exhausting me. <laughs> so let me just deal with this grief now. Because if you deal with any child reactively and remember that the heart is a child, the heart is a child. It behaves like a child. If you deal with any child reactively, if a child comes into the room and is afraid and you get afraid of them being afraid and start behaving afraid around them, it's not going to calm them down in any way. And if a child comes in a room and a child is angry and it annoys you and so you behave annoyed, that's really not going to help. It's the same with the heart. Many of us have done a lot of emotional work and wonder why we're just making no progress. First of all, we know all the reasons why we're crying and unhappy and everything, and that's one of the reasons why we're not making any progress, because we haven't really sunk down there deep enough yet while we're still holding on to all the mental stuff. But another reason why we're not getting through it is because we're reacting to our own heart. We're going in there as a reaction. All we really know how to do is react. Okay, we're reactive beings. Reactive behavior is pretty much all we're made of while we live in a time-based paradigm. So you could take almost anybody on this planet and ask them what their heart's desire is and give that to them and put them on, an, on a desert island with everything they desire except people and pets and they will go into deep depression and probably just die because we don't know how to do anything for ourselves. Remember that we start the world off when we start in this world. I brush my teeth because my mother tells me to. I eat because I get smacked around the ear if I don't. Uh, all of the stuff, the clothes that are bought for me are bought by my mother. Everything is decided and it's all through a reaction. And then, of course, if I behave too spontaneously, then I'm told not to behave like that. And by not behaving like that and creating an act in its place, which I can react in a reactive behavior, then I find I get rewarded for my act. So we're all reactive beings until we start to respond to what's happening to us. And that's why often our journey in towards spirituality is done as a reaction, not as a response. And we also wonder why we don't have any real success. By allowing myself to feel my, first my fear, in order to do that I have to feel. And then I allow myself to feel my anger. And then I allow myself to feel my grief and to sink through that until I'm no longer afraid of those feelings. In other words, I'm no longer running from what's happening to me in the moment. I can start to settle into my, into my emotional body. It's no longer a place I'm afraid of. I will find that when I arrive at that place, I will have developed a vocabulary which we can just call feeling. Profound vocabulary. It's vast, and from, from our point of view at the moment, it's li- unlimited. So, for example, this is quite a limited thing. It's a bottle with some weird-looking liquid in it. It's got a blue cap. It's a physical thing. But I could get you each to write a 20-page essay about this bottle, and you would all write something completely different about it. This is quite limited, but the mental, because you're going to go mental about it, that's why it's called the mental plane, because if we stay there, we go mental. The mental plane is far more vast than this limited little physical item here. And the emotional plane is just as equally or even more advanced than the mental plane. So there is no limit to what we can feel and the type of feelings we can have if we learn the language of feeling. 
And if we learn to interact with our life from a point of feeling, because life is a feeling, it's really not a mental concept, and it really is not a physical circumstance. If you ended up on a hut on the beach with some basic, simple food every day, but you were just feeling good, you would just go, all right, this is all right. You can end up in a mansion on the hill with everything you want, and if you're feeling poorly, now if I allow myself to be in the moment and to feel whatever's happening to me and to stop running from it, what happens is I start to enter a unity with myself. I'm no longer running into one experience and heading away from another. And this is when I start to enter what's called joy. And because we're mental and we're adults and we're looking for happiness, we make the mistake of thinking joy is an emotion, right? Joy is not an emotion. Joy is a relationship that I have with my emotional body. Joy is a relationship that I have with my emotional body. What gives me joy is my relationship with my heart. In other words, when I allow myself to feel everything that is happening to me, I don't run from it anymore, then I enter joy. That's my relationship with my emotional body. In other words, I can wake up in the morning and feel what in the past would have been, I would have interpreted conceptually as depression, feeling depressed today, and still be in joy. Because when I'm in a state of joy and I feel this feeling that I would have called depression, to me it's now it's just energy. It's a feeling that I wake up with. I don't try and push it down. I don't pr try and pretend it's not there. I don't enter authentic behavior in an attempt to get away from it. I allow it to be there. In fact, I embrace it. I go, this is interesting. Let me be with this today. And what I'll find is if I allow myself to be with that feeling all day, by the end of the day, I'll have a real deep appreciation of what that day has for me. I'll have had a deep experience of the day. And this is the key thing now, you see. If I allow myself to feel and stay in this experience and allow myself to operate from the causal point of this experience and see how I'm connected through thought, word and deed to everything that's happening around me and be able to feel it, what it suddenly dawns on me is that this is the spiritual experience I was looking for. If a parent gives a child $500 and the child pushes the $500 aside and says, I don't want this, I want something else. The parent will still look after the child if the child allows it. Because if the child is that reactive, the child won't even really allow the parent to take care of it. The parent will do the best to take care of the child. But it will not give the child any more money because the child doesn't appreciate it. Appreciation is an interesting word. It's a double-edged word. I appreciate something because I'm grateful for it. But if I have stocks and shares and they appreciate, it means they become more. So now if a parent gives a child $500 and the child appreciates it, in other words, takes this $500 and turns it into $2,500, the parent will happily give the child more and more and more with the intent that one day it will give the child everything that it has because it knows it will grow through appreciation. So if God gives me this life, right, and I go, I don't want this life, I'm, I want a spiritual experience. And I push this life aside that I'm in, and I go out and I seek some spiritual experience so that I can get close to God. But if I allow myself to sit in the middle of what I've been given and appreciate it, and I'm grateful for it, not by comparison. In other words, I'm not grateful that I have this bottle of water because I know that there's people in Somalia who have no water, because that causes separation. But if I'm grateful for this water because I can just feel how amazing it is when I drink it, I can just appreciate it because it's given to me, because everything I know is given to me. Then through my appreciation, it becomes more. And when the giver sees that I have appreciated what I'm given and that I'm making more out of it, then more is given. And suddenly the experience that I'm standing in starts to deepen and become more profound. And I realize that there ain't no spiritual experience that can match up to right this right now. So if I then want to respond to the giver, I'm not going to approach the giver in a state of reaction. I'm not going to approach the giver running away from something towards something in a state of conflict. So I'm going to approach the giver in a state of gratitude. Also, I will have the vocabulary to do so because the giver is of vibrational, which we might call spiritual. I prefer the word vibrational, but vibrational says to me what it is. So I can get, my, get myself around that. So if I want to approach the vibrational and have an experience of the giver, I'm now able to do so because I've developed a vocabulary, the vocabulary of feeling which is required in order to perceive the vibrational. 
If I go directly to the vibrational without having developed that vocabulary, then it doesn't matter how much I meditate, it doesn't matter how much I pray, even if the giver is going, hello, no, I'm not going to hear it. Because the way that I enter the vibrational, the way that I begin to interact with the vibrational is through the eyes of the emotional body, which is through felt perception. God is a feeling. And the only people who say God doesn't exist or presence doesn't exist are people who can't feel. They can discuss it and analyze it and give their points of view, but they have no emotional body awareness. Once I develop my emotional body awareness and I feel what this is about and I feel the presence, then I can interact and have an absolute conscious relationship with that presence myself. I don't have to go to anybody else and go, excuse me, what's the presence saying? And what should I do to talk to the presence? And what does the presence have to tell me today? I don't have to do that. Also, because the emotional body is the causal point of my experience, it's where everything's coming from. So this here, this physical thing, where do you think this came from? It was a feeling that someone had that became a concept and that was then manufactured into the physical. It, was, it used to be energy in motion and because things matter to us, it matters. Everything in this world comes through the feeling, through the heart. But I don't know that if I can't feel. So when I quieten my heart, when the grief, anger and fear comes to balance and I allow myself to feel everything, mm -hmm. then what happens is there's no conflict anymore. That inner war is gone and it becomes very quiet and still in there. It doesn't go and all that, okay? It goes very quiet and still there. In fact, nothing happens. In there. And in that nothingness and in that silence comes everything. Out of it comes everything. And if I want to know anything, if I have any questions to ask, I can ask there. And the answer will come through the pathway of awareness as a feeling that will grapple around a mental concept and enter my physical world. So the answer will come as an emotional, mental, and physical experience, not just as some mental concept in my head. Anything I want to know, ask and you will receive. The emotional body is a rite of passage. If we don't get real with what we are feeling, then everything else will become inauthentic to us. We'll have to go and imagine it. So just because we know that the emotional body is the causal point of our experiences, it doesn't mean that we should just leap in there. Okay, I'm just going to get in there, fix that up and get on with things, okay? My heart isn't something I'm going to get over and then carry on with something else. My heart is my responsibility forever, forever. My heart is the child within me. Unless you become a child again, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless I take care of this part of my experience, the child, I cannot enter a state of balance. So there's some things about working with the heart that are very important. Consistency. It's just like working with a child, being a parent to a child. Consistency. Responsibility. In other words, responding to it always, not reacting to it. Compassion. That's a trinity of working with the heart. It's something that I've got to work with every single day. There's no day in which I have a day off from that because that is the causal point of my experience. I better be responsible for that. Other people can go and do physical things for me. They can go and deliver goods for me. Oh, they can even rub my body for me. They can do all sorts of things for me physically. And other people can do mental stuff for me. They can go and stand up in a court of law and speak on my behalf. But no one can feel for me. And that's why it gets shut off here. It's not the world's job to take care of our emotions. Because if the world did take care of it and encourage it, we would enter emotional responsibility reactively. We would do it because of something happening outside of us. If we're going to enter emotional responsibility, it must be a call from within us because of something that's happening within us. There is no conspiracy trying to keep us. None of that going on. It's just that if you don't take responsibility, someone will do it on your behalf. If you don't take care of this, someone else will make decisions for you. Someone else will take your power for you. So because consistency and responsibility and compassion is important when working with the heart, we enter it as a process, a process that trains us to become responsible in our thinking, that enables us to start doing gradual, consistent work each day, because no one has taught us how to do this. All our drama that we are experiencing externally in the world is really manifest so that we can get attention from others because we don't know how to give it to ourselves. 
That's the source of all drama. If I'm feeling kind of ignored today, maybe if I go to hospital, people will come visit me. <laughs> I get flowers, fruit and stuff, and people that I don't really like anyway will come around and talk to me, and at least I'll have someone to talk to. So we do a lot of drama in our life to get attention because no one taught us how to give us attention, ourselves attention. The teachers of emotional maturity are ourselves. Emotional growing up takes place by the way that we interact with our own hearts. My heart is a child, and not only is my heart the child, but my heart is the creator. It's made in the image of the creator. It has the same creative capacities to create experience. You will note in sacred texts, there is no mention of the adults in heaven. There is no mention of God or the Creator making adults. They always talk about children. There are no adults. There are just children that are dead, children in resistance, and children pretending to be something that they're not. And that child part of myself is running the show. An adult may be able to manufacture different things, but a child creates. A child can make something out of nothing. And if my child believes that love is abandonment, then whenever I want love, I will meet somebody and I will initially manifest and experience love, roses, whining and dining and all that. But a little bit down the line, I will manifest an experience of abandonment because that to me what love is. If I want to undo that, then I need to teach my child a new behavior, give it a new example. I need to set the example. The world isn't going to. And that example is set by the way that I work with my own heart. No one can do that for me. That's my responsibility. So the presence process is a, a procedure that moves over about 10 weeks that assists us to move from reactive to responsive behavior that enables us to start working from a, the causal point of our experience and that will show us experientially because we need to see it experientially we don't need to see it as a concept that this really is the causal point of my experience. The presence process will give you an opportunity to find out that if you change what's going on in here, that outside will change. That's what it's designed to do. So tomorrow, what are we going to do? We're going to go for a journey together through the presence process, those of you that come tomorrow. We're going to do a 70-day process in under six hours. <laughs> For the brave. <laughs> For the brave of heart. We're going to take a look at this process and look at its different components, why it's structured the way it is. Often people look at the presence process and they say, but I, I've done breathing before and I, I, I've, I've done these affirmation things before and I've, so I've done this stuff before. Well, it's not about the stuff. If we go for a tarot card reading, for example, and the tarot card reader puts out the cards and we go, hang on a moment, I've seen those cards before. <laughs> You're a fake, I've seen those cards before. I'm not having a reading from you. It's not about the cards, it's about the relationship between them and if you can read that. The process is about the relationship between the different parts of it and the intent underlying it. And so we'll take a look at that tomorrow and we'll be able to do some work ourselves internally. There will be no drama, no one has to do any public crying. <laughs> we don't do that here. You can do that at home as much as you like. So we're not going to be asking anyone to bear their emotions, although you will feel them throughout the day. And already some of you would have had in the last week or so have been, had some upsets come up so you can work with them tomorrow. All right. You know what those are in the last week or two. So we'll work through that during the course of the day, go through the process and give you a taste for what it's about and go deeper into it for those of you that have already done it and take a good look at it for those of you that are considering doing it. We heal so that we can go out and play because really this is what this is about. The creator is not a healer. The creator is a creator. Nothing that's created needs to be fixed. So healing is a transitional journey. It's not somewhere we stay, something we move through. We heal so that we can create. We heal so that we can go out and play. So we'll end with a bit of play on Sunday. And by then you'll have a very good idea of what this is all about and be able to make a really good choice for yourself as to whether this is something you want to get involved in on your own. Because in the end, there is nothing anyone can do for us in the emotional realm. When we really get in and do this work, we do it on our own. We do it on our own. And normally what will happen is by the end of the weekend, and it won't happen now because I'm bringing it up, someone will say, can we form a presence process group? <laughs> So we want to get addicted to a group now. The, the nature of the presence process is that it will assist you to work in the group in which you've been placed, the authentic group, the cashier behind the counter, the person at work, the family members who are just blowing your mind. 
<laughs> okay? That's your group. That is the group. That's our authentic group. When we go and form a special group to do special work, then we are moving again into inauthenticity. We want to stay with what's really happening to us and work with that. That's where the goods are. That's where the gifts are. That's where the fear, anger, and grief is being beautifully reflected. Okay? We are going to work with that and learn what to do about that. We're going to go through lots of stuff, but don't try and hold on to anything. Now you get something, get it and let it go. Don't try and have an experience. We're already having one. And we're going to be asking a lot of questions today. Questions are going to come up throughout the day. And don't try and answer them if the answer isn't there. That's a big problem we have at the moment, is we're only interested in answers. And the question is the causal point. So, for example, if I ask you what the time is, what would you do? Look at my watch. Well, do it. Give us a demonstration. Okay. So I asked a question and energy moved. That's the power of the question. It will move energy. So the questions that we go through today, if you don't know the answer to them, don't try and find it. Because normally what we do is we ask a question, and if we don't get the answer, then we say, well, I can't remember that because it happened too long ago. Or I can't remember that because I don't have a very good memory. Or I can't remember that because... We're taught that the answer is going to come as some mental concept in our head. The answer is our life experience, always. Our life experience in any given moment is the answer to the questions we've been asked. So the questions we ask today, if you don't have the answer, it's okay. The answers will come, okay, as our life experience. Today what we're going to do is nothing, really. I mean, you'll notice we didn't do anything yesterday either. We're not going to try and avoid doing anything today either. What we're going to be doing is working with our attention and our intention all day. We're going to guide it through a journey. And our experience in any given moment is the sum of our attention and our intention. Our attention is a tool of the mental body and our intention is a tool of the emotional body. Our intention, our emotional body being the causal point of our experience, is always driving our attention. And wherever our attention is, that's where our life experience is happening in any given moment. And the quality of that experience is determined by the intention that's driving. So experience equals attention over intention. Simple as that. Those are the two tools we work with 24 hours a day. Those are the tools that have got us into a time-based paradigm and the very same tools that we use to extract ourselves from a time-based paradigm and re-enter present moment awareness. What this is all about is the art of integrative change. Integrate phonetically is into greatness, into wholeness, and our wholeness when we experience our wholeness, that's when we experience our holiness. So it's a return to wholeness is what integration is. An integrative experience, part of it is about getting it. And what getting it is, you wouldn't have laughed at the story about Fluffy unless you got it. And in the moment that you got it, there was an opening and you laughed. So throughout the day, we're going to have other openings happen. Now, the thing about the mind is it wants to go and fiddle with the way the thing's opened and see if it can make it open again. So, for example, if I say to you, beautiful, and then I say to you, be you till full, Beautiful. Now, when you get that, that's an opening. What the mind goes is, what other words are like that? <laughs> okay, forget the opening that I just experienced. What other words? Okay. So I can give you a list, but it's not about the words. It's about what happens, the opening. In the opening is when integration is taking place. So integration is not about fixing anything. We're not here to fix anything. We're here to move our attention to that part that is always whole and complete, to become aware of that again. We're not here to learn anything. We're here to remember, to become a member again, remember. We're here to achieve justice. In the world, justice actually means revenge. That's not the justice we're after. The justice we're after is when we remove our interpretations about what we think is going on, when we can separate ourselves from our stories, from our personal histories, so that we are able to arrive in the moment and see it just as it is. That is just is. It just is. That's the justice we're after. This is also not about recovery. We don't want to cover up what's come up in our faces. That's what recovery is. To live in recovery is to live in quiet desperation. Because what recovery is about is my wounds come up and I will find any way to cover them up again, whether I sedate or control myself or I join a group and become addicted to that. And then I'll say, well, I'm living in recovery. You take anyone who's living in recovery and you take them away from all those support systems and they will go straight back to what they're trying to cover up. 
So this is not about recovery. This is about discovery. So when something opens and there's a wound, we want to go right into the wound. We don't want to cover it up again. Our awareness is what transforms anything. That's the transformative power that we have. By placing our awareness in the core of the wound, awareness transforms. This is also not about destination consciousness. We're not trying to get anywhere. We're not trying to get anything over with. We don't want to put a time limit on anything. We're embracing journey consciousness. In other words, we're embracing a way of being in the world that's going to be ongoing. The mind loves destination consciousness. It likes to have a beginning and an end to something. When will this be over? Give me a date, time and place so I can put it in my schedule. That's how the mind likes to operate. Our heart isn't something that we can diarize, schedule, have a five-year plan for. My five-year plan for my heart is this. Integrative change is also a perceptual journey. We can move from incorrect to correct perception. We can move from seeing ourselves as physical, mental and emotional beings striving for some sort of spiritual experience to realizing that we're a vibrational essence having a transient physical, mental and emotional experience. We can go from reactive behavior to responsive behavior. We can go from separation consciousness to unity consciousness. We can go to having awareness only of the past and potential future to having awareness of the present moment. We can go from looking at the world to actually seeing it, from hearing the world to actually listening to it, from lack to abundance, from effort to ease. These are all changes that happen within us. And the astounding thing about these changes are you only have to make one to make them all. You don't have to make all these changes, only one. Because if I go from separation consciousness to oneness, I'm automatically going to go from lack to abundance. And if I go from thinking about my dreams, which is what, only what sleeping people do, to being aware of my vision, I'm automatically going to go from victim and victor consciousness to vehicle consciousness. And if I go from fear to love, I'm automatically going to go from reacting to responding. So it's just about really making one shift to make them all. All of those descriptions are all descriptions of exactly the same shift. And the shift is internal. For a while, what we're going to do here is just really work with the intention of the day. And we can start by choosing one issue in our life experience that we would like to transform. You know what it is. Just choose it. I'd like to transform that. Try to get away from the when, where, how, what, all that stuff. And you'll notice about that issue that it has a feeling related to it. Otherwise, it wouldn't grab your attention. So if you do want to navigate the transformation of it, what feeling would you have instead of that feeling? Now, all of us in the last short while had an emotional upset happen. Especially if you come into this workshop, you would have had an emotional upset come up in your life, right there in front of you. Yes. So you know what that is, and it's deliberately placed there so that you have something to work with. <laughs> Put your attention on that and acknowledge it. There it is. That's, that's my stuff for the day. Okay. Then place your attention on three things about your parents that you really disliked. Three things. And then... Place your attention on three things about your parents that you really loved. And now, if any of you arrived here with questions, just put your attention on those questions internally for a moment. So there are some foundations around integrative change which eases our journey through it. And let's have a look at these. The first is that we cannot change ourselves. And many of us have tried for a long time to change ourselves and got nowhere. Because that intent is it's really incorrect. Because what I am can't be changed. What I am is created perfect and always will be. However, my experience that I'm having may be somewhat out of balance. So it's not about trying to change myself, because I can spend eternity trying to change myself. But what is made perfect can only remain perfect, and that's, what, that's why it's labeled perfect. That which is perfect cannot become imperfect. But my experience can go out of balance. And the thing about experience is that constant in all experience, is change. Experience is always changing. So if I am able to stand back from my experience and rather work with my experience than try and change myself, I know I can change my experience quite easily because the constant of all experience is change. Any changes we make for or because of anybody else will not be real and lasting. When the person that we're making changes for moves out of the picture, we will go back to the way it was before. So, for example, I can't give up smoking cigarettes because my partner doesn't like the smell of it. Because if I do, once my partner's out of the picture, I'm going to have a cigarette. <laughs> so integrative change must only be for myself, with myself. It must be self-willed. 
Here's another one. How many of us believe we create our own realities? Don't be shy, put up your hands. How, how many of us believe we create our own realities? Okay, so am I part of your reality? Yeah? yeah. So would you please tell me what's in my bag? <laughs> the detail I haven't worked Stop. out yet. <laughs> so we, we really need, to, if we want to make real change in our life, if we want to get authentic, we need to get real with ourselves. That's part of the journey. And when I walk through the airport, I don't determine what cologne that person is wearing, what flowers are over there in the corner. I don't determine all those little details. If I created my own reality, I would be determining those finest details. I'd be able to tell you about it before I walked in there. So let's stay as real where we are about where we are as we can, because if we don't, we're going to get stuck. So on some level, where we are one, where we are the Godhead or whatever that is, maybe we create this reality. But here where we are, having this human experience, to say that we do is to be inauthentic. And then we're going to get stuck there. Okay? Because we go around doing those affirmations over and over. Because I create my own reality, I'm going to do these affirmations over and over. Stick them on the mirror, stick them on the door, stick them everywhere. But they don't work. Because again, the intention is faulty. So once in Tucson, I was sitting on the porch, and it was raining, and I was with a couple of friends, and someone said, oh, I hate the rain. You know, it makes me feel miserable. And someone else said, well, I actually like the rain, especially when it's cold and rainy. I can sit in bed, watch videos, drink hot chocolate. And I said something like, no, the rain's great. I love walking in the rain. See all those reflections in the puddle in the streets. It's beautiful. And in that moment, because up until then, I believed I created my own reality. That's a new age thing. We create our own reality. In that moment, I realized that the rain was happening for all of us. And what we were doing in each moment, we were creating our experience of it. So maybe together we create this reality, but then I'm co-creating it. To say I create my own reality is somewhat selfish, actually. It's a co-creation. But what's real, what I can work with now and be authentic about, is that I create my experience of what is unfolding in every given moment. So let's work with that. Let's work with our experience of the reality that's unfolding around us and get with that, master that first. The thing about integrative change too is initially it's uncomfortable and that's where the work weeds out those that are not ready for it. Because if you're looking for good and easy, you won't come and do this stuff. Initially, it's not about good and easy and when you really get involved in this work, you will let go any desire for good and easy because you will realize that every time you've gone towards good and easy, you've gone away from that which will make you grow. So initially, this work is uncomfortable because the mind is addicted to familiarity. It's a tool of attachment. It likes to attach to something, hold on to it, and get comfortable with that. And then we say, you know, so I want to change. I really, really want to change. Now, honestly, I want to change. And then the moment things start to change, the mind will use words such as unfamiliar, wrong, evil, because it's not familiar anymore. Something's going wrong. And if I listen to the mind, I will go into a place of fear or resistance, and then I'll back into my familiar place and go back to where it's comfortable. So if I honestly want to change, then I must be prepared to embrace discomfort as a sign that I'm going in the right direction. Integrative change also requires surrender, to be open to outcome, but not to have an agenda about the outcome. I just have to be open to an outcome. And surrender is a beautiful word too, sure ender, end of being sure. Integrative change is also instantaneous and organic. So it's in instantaneous because we may get certain things right away. I get this completely. But then what I get is going to unfold organically in my life experience. The shift only takes a moment. It doesn't take time to make the shift. But because of the densities of the various bodies we're working with, different densities of the emotional, mental, physical body, it takes time for these changes to move through the pathway of awareness and into our experience. So that's why we're given time. There's plenty of time to change. <laughs> So yesterday we took a look at the pathway of awareness and how we come into the world from the vibrational in the womb through the emotional of childhood, through the mental of teenagehood and into the physical experience of being adults. And today what we're going to do is take a gradual journey from physical presence into mental clarity, into emotional balance using the tools of the presence process. And we're not going to do anything again. All the tools of the presence process are really not doings. They're really undoings. We don't want to do anything. We want to undo. So even though I'm talking, I'm not a rapper. I'm an unwrapper. <laughs> 
We're going to use three main tools here in the presence process. The first is breathing. Is there any way to get the room cooler for us? Because you can feel all that emotional stuff. <laughs> this room is really starting to heat up. Okay, well, maybe we're supposed to cook today. All right, so the first tool that we're going to look at is the breathing. And what we use the breathing to do is to start extracting us from a time-based awareness. So most of us spend our time or our days in time. In other words, we're driving in the car, and while we're in the car, we're thinking about tomorrow, or we're thinking about what's going on in the office, or thinking about the conversation I just had with somebody else. I'm still trying to make my point, even though they're gone. Okay? No, I tell you, that's just how it's going to be. Really, I'm right on this one. Okay? Cars are proof that there is a God, because we are not driving somebody is <laughs> God is tired of driving our cars and would like to do something else especially there's more and more cars God has to do more and more driving <laughs> so that's an addiction it's an addiction to being in that mental place we live in that mental place most of us and if you want to have an experience of what that's like, just put your eyes on my hand and keep them there. Don't take your eyes off my hand. And now think about where you had lunch yesterday. Keep your attention on my hand and think about the lunch. And if you think about it long enough, you can smell the lunch. You can taste the lunch. You can hear the conversation over the lunch. You can feel the cutlery in your hands. And yet it's not real. But you can be there and here. So the only thing that's real is here my hand that you're looking at in this moment. But yet you can be fully in another place to the point that it's absolutely real to you. And then what's even crazier is that we can make decisions based on being there and what's going on in that place. That's when it starts getting really weird. We can also go into the future very easily. So if you put your, ha um, your eyes on my hand again and think about where you're going to sleep tonight. And if you stay in that place long enough, you can feel the, the, the linen, temperature of the room, smell the room, hear the sounds around there. But it's not real. And yet we make decisions based on being in that place too. Now how can those decisions in any way serve us? So the time that we're concerned about is not clock time. It's not about not wearing a watch. Okay, I'm at present moment, I don't wear a watch anymore. It's not about clock time. Clock time is time, the cycles of the world, the cycles of life. Clock time is not an issue. Clocks are very useful. The time that we're concerned in looking at is emotional time. In other words, my attention can go to yesterday and my attention can go to tomorrow. But what is driving that? It's my intention. And the two things that are driving me where my habit of entering that time-based experience began is when I was a child and had experiences that were overwhelming and that I couldn't integrate. And so what I said was, what happened? And by saying what happened, I started creating a place back there. And then I said, how can I stop that from happening again? And I started creating a place over there. And that's now how I operate. So we want to extract ourselves from that sort of behavior because although it appears like we are having a real experience, we're not. The only moment that is real is this one, and it's only in this experience that we can have a taste of what life is. Life only occurs in this moment. If we want to have an experience of what God is, God only occurs in this moment. So essentially, when we go into the future and to the past like that, we are dead. We're the living dead. So essentially what we're doing is raising ourselves from the dead by extracting ourselves from this illusionary time-based paradigm. And one of the tools for doing so, the most profound tool we can use for doing so, is our breathing. Because breath, for us in this paradigm, is life. Take it away from someone. You can take water away from somebody, and they will last quite a while. Take food away from someone. Mind you, these days, if you take food away from people, they don't die of starvation. They die of toxicity. Because all the poisons we've been eating just suddenly get dumped in the body. It's very hard to die of starvation these days. We die of toxicity. But take food away from somebody, and they can last a while. Take water away from somebody and they can last a while but remove that breath you can watch the second hands on them be over soon breath of life the thing about breath is it doesn't exist tomorrow and it doesn't exist yesterday breathing only exists in this moment that's why we don't breathe the human being is an interesting breathing creature because the human being unconsciously pauses between breathing all the time. If you want to watch someone on a telephone, it's very easy. Hello? <laughs> no. <clears throat> really? 
<laughs> See, that person's not there. They left. And when you leave, you don't need to breathe because there's only breathing in the present moment. So what we do is we use breathing just for basic bodily maintenance. Pop in, take a few breaths, I'm off again. <laughs> there are animals that do that, but they consciously pause their breathing. So a hippo will go under the water, come up. Dolphins too will do that. It's called pranayama yoga. <laughs> <laughs> so what we want to do is we don't want to control our breathing to do this process we want to release our control on it something like pranayama yoga is a practice of breath control we are already controlling our breathing but doing so unconsciously we're already going <gasps> <laughs> so what we want to do is release the control of our breathing and teach ourselves how to breathe like an ordinary human being. And if you want to see how to breathe, watch the dog or watch the cat. Don't breathe like the dog because people will get a little nervous around you. Because <laughs> dogs are... <laughs> the thing to watch about the dog is that the breaths are connected and the cat too. It'll be a... So when we connect our breathing, consciously connect our breathing, and participate in the breathing process, which we have to do because we've been doing it so unconsciously. <coughs> so initially we want to participate in it, and we connect our breathing consciously. An aspect of our awareness, even though it is really small, has to remain in this moment. For me to connect my breathing, I have to at some point, some part of me remain here to do that. And so it's a way that I can begin anchoring myself in this moment. And when I successfully begin anchoring myself in this moment, what is automatically going to come to my attention is the places that I'm addicted to running into. They're going to start rattling because I'm not paying them any attention and I'm addicted to that. So my fix is to go there and be afraid of that and control that and worry that and make plans and decisions based on all that stuff. And so as I hold myself here, then they will come up into my attention. Then I can process them and they will come up into my attention in various ways. Initially they'll come up as physical experiences because that's where my awareness is. Then they'll come up as mental insights about my own level of mental confusion, my belief systems. And eventually as I continue to do the work they will come up as energetic experiences because that's the causal point which is as emotional, energy and emotional experiences which I will perceive because I'm mental as fear, anger and grief. And then I can process them. So when we connect our breathing consciously, and in this process we only do it for 15 minutes a day, twice a day, and that's all that's required to initiate that process. Because the now or this present moment is such a powerful place, it has such a powerful presence about it, which we'll talk about in a moment, that just when we place ourselves in that domain for a few moments, real and lasting change is activated in our experience. Not to us, to our experience. So it's a core tool and one of the tools we use. Another interesting thing about breathing, breathing is a profound procedure and I highly recommend it to everybody. <laughs> There's some interesting things to look at around our experience. For example, we only use, I'll use the arbitrary number of 13, just by way of illustration. We only use about 13% of our lung capacity and we only take in about 13% of our oxygen. That's why we have to go to shops and buy oxygen and a tablet. Have you ever heard of such a thing? <laughs> I'm going to buy my oxygen and a tablet. I'm really into breathing, so I'll just a few tabs. Yeah. Instant oxygen. I recommend doing the breathing like we were designed to. So we only take in about 13% of our oxygen. We're also told that we're only using about 13% of our brain. We're also told by psychologists that we're only 13% conscious. The rest is happening unconsciously to us. And the scientists will tell us apparently only about 13% of our DNA is doing anything. The rest is what we call junk DNA. So that's an interesting kind of correlation there. Now, it's very difficult for me to get up in the morning and say, you know what, that's it, I'm turning over a new leaf, I'm now going to use 26% of my DNA today. It's also really not possible for me to get up and go, I'm tired of being so stupid. Today, enough of this stupid stuff. I'm going to use more of my brain from today onwards. I'm going to use 25% um, more brain capacity. It's also very hard for me to get up and go, well, I'm tired of being such an unconscious person. I'm going to be, hmm, let's say, 32% more conscious today. Not going to happen. 
But what I can do is get up and go, I'm going to breathe more. I'm going to use more of my lung capacity. And just say just a little bit more. I'm not going to overdo it because anything I do in big doses, I always end up giving up anyway. So let me do it consistently. I'm going to breathe. I'm going to breathe for 15 minutes twice a day. And so oxygenate myself more and use more of my lung capacity. And then we find unusual experiences start to occur. First of all, we start to get a little smarter, we start to understand things that we couldn't understand before. We start to feel more aware. Colors look a little different and textures, we start to notice textures and become more aware of sounds and things around us. And we also start to have sudden moments of insight as if DNA is being triggered or something like that. So oxygen is a profound tool. It's one of the secrets of the universe, oxygen. So we use breathing as a tool for anchoring our awareness in the present moment and supporting that whole process. We also use what we call perceptual tools throughout the process. Before I left South Africa, I thought, how many perceptual tools are there in this book? So I sat down and I counted them all. And I counted over 50 perceptual tools in the presence process. And I know there's more. And what a perceptual tool is, it adjusts our perception. So first of all, by breathing, we're not doing anything yet, right? Because we're already breathing, we're just going to breathe consciously. So no one's asking us to do anything yet. I want to go in that place. Perceptual tools are very simple of how they work. They ask us to perceive the world in a different way and see what happens. And we're already perceiving the world in a certain way, so we're just asked to change that perception. We don't have to do anything. So, for example, the pathway of awareness and the seven-year cycle that we spoke about, that's a perceptual tool. Once you see the pathway of awareness, once you realize how that works, your life is never the same. You have a consciousness about things that wasn't there before, and you didn't do anything. And you'll start to notice how you use that pathway of awareness every day. So if there's an address that I want to buy, I want to buy it because it makes me feel good. And then I try and figure out how I'm going to afford it because of all the, the money I've already spent on my credit cards. And then I'm going to go, oh, what the hell, and go and buy it anyway. And I go and physically buy it and wear it. So I'm still going to go from emotional to mental to physical. That's the pathway of awareness we use every day. That's a perceptual tool. It doesn't take any effort. So we use perceptual tools all the way through the presence process. And then what we also use is what we call presence activation statements, which one can also call affirmations. But we don't use the word affirmations because we don't want to confuse what we're doing with positive thinking, because positive thinking is a reaction to a negative experience. We only use positive thinking when we're feeling negatively about something, when we're having a hard time. No one bothers about positive thinking if they're in peace. So it's a reactive tool, and that's why it's not very successful. Well, let's just think positively about this. It's a reaction. Also, we don't use affirmations in the context of the mind power of going, you know, we've all done it. I'm abundant. I'm abundant. <laughs> I know I'm abundant. I was born abundant. Abundance is what I am. Abundance is my middle name. I am abundant. <laughs> Everywhere I look, I see abundance. Abundance flows around me like the breath that I breathe. I'm abundant. And then we look in our wallet, and, well, nothing much has changed. <laughs> Okay, and we've all been through that. It didn't work, so we don't really do that much anymore unless we're really banging our head against the wall. Mm -hmm. So the reasons that those affirmations don't work is because not having any money is not a cause of anything. It's an effect of something. It's an effect of what's going on in my emotional body. And by trying to focus on the money situation, what I'm doing is I'm fiddling with an effect. And one cannot make changes by fiddling with an effect. That's called ineffectual behavior. So we don't do affirmations in line with what those are, nor do we do positive thinking. In fact, our presence activation statements have the opposite effect of what we would like positive thinking to do for us. So, for example, the statement in session one is, I choose to experience this moment. Now, if I really allow myself to be with that, and I repeat that to myself, I choose to experience this moment, I choose to experience this moment, what's going to happen is the opposite, okay? Because if I want peace, the fact is the whole world is at peace. I don't know if you noticed. We live in a world that's full of peace. Just remove all the drama and you'll see the beautiful peace that's already here. Peace doesn't have to be made. Walk in the forest over there, it's at peace. Unless, of course, you take your drama in there, then there's no peace. So peace doesn't have to be created or made. Peace is given. Nor does the present moment have to be created. And we don't really have to choose to enter it because we're in it all the time, whether we're aware of it or not. So when I say I choose to experience this moment, what's going to happen is I'm going to become aware of where I'm unable to experience this moment because it's those things that are stealing my attention from the moment that's happening. 
So if I authentically want peace, if I'm sincere about entering peace, then my first experience is going to be that of awareness of chaos. If I really ask for peace, I'm heading for chaos because it's the chaos that's hiding the peace from me that's already there. And I need to resolve that chaos. I need to integrate it. So these affirmations that we use, these presence activation statements, cause the opposite of what they say. Be warned. <laughs> but we want that because the opposite, those chaotic things will lead us to the emotional signatures that we want to work with. So let's just look once more at not doings. What not doing is about if we think of ourselves, what we are, our authentic essence as being water, and we think of our physical, mental, and emotional experiences that are causing us discomfort, in fact, all our physical, mental, and emotional experiences, but that's how we to work on our discomfort, is being oil. Whenever we do something to try and rectify the situation, we are going to automatically be reacting to it. And that's the same as taking this jar of oil and water and shaking it. Every time we do something, I'm going to go and tell that person exactly how I feel so that they will... I'm going to go and explain myself to this person so I can feel at peace about what's going on here. Whenever I go and do something to deal with my stuff, I'm shaking the jar of oil and water. And then I cannot even perceive a difference between the oil and the water. It just becomes this murky stuff. So what a not doing is, or a process of undoing, is when I enter activities or a way of being that enables me to place the jar down and leave it alone. That's the response. And when I do that, the oil and water are automatically going to surface. The oil and water automatically. And then I can use the perceptual tools and procedures that I'm taught throughout the process to scoop off that oil that's not serving me anymore, to work with that experience that's making it uncomfortable for me because that is going to surface in my awareness. If I allow myself to come to stillness and use my intent to enter this moment, then everything that is dragging me away is going to start coming to my attention. That's the oil coming up. In session one of the presence process, it's really an introductory to the whole experience. The first thing we do in there is take a look at what we call our inner presence. Our inner presence is that part of us that is whole and complete and perfect and always remains untouched by our experiences. To think of it as a metaphor that we could say that the giver or what we may call God or the creator is a sun and our inner presence is a ray from that sun. So that ray is within us all that we can tune into. And that ray has certain attributes about it. This is why our task in the presence process is to lay a foundation for a relationship with that part of ourselves. This is where the, the, the surrender comes in. This is where the co-creative aspect of the experience comes in. Because it will know exactly what is required. So our task is to lay a relationship with it so that we can begin and have an authentic relationship in which we can communicate backwards and forwards and understand its communications and stand back in a way, get out of our way, and allow it to start facilitating us. That's the facilitator we really want to be facilitated by. So it has certain attributes. The first attribute is that it knows no order of difficulty. Now in the world, if I go to a doctor, for instance, and I have a cough, or if I go to a doctor and I have cancer, the doctor will treat me differently because the doctor works by order of difficulty. Presence, our inner presence, does not operate from order of difficulty. It knows no order of difficulty. It is a ray of that which created everything. And that which creates everything, what is difficult for it? Nothing. So we want to tune in with that frequency. Our inner presence also has our best interest at heart, our highest interest. It doesn't operate from an ego place. It doesn't say, I've been talking to you for six years <laughs> solidly and you haven't listened to a word I've said, so you know what? I'm not saying anything anymore. See how that works for you. <laughs> it doesn't operate from that place. So it's good to have a friend that doesn't operate like that. And that friend really is us, but it's good to have that friend. Also, if I had to extract the presence from you, and I had to extract the presence from you, and I had to extract the presence from you, and I had to put them behind my back and shuffle them up, and then I had to go take yours, you wouldn't be able to. First of all, because there would still only be one presence in my hand. And presence within each of us is identical to the point that it's the same presence. It's a ray of the same sun. 
And this attribute is really important when it comes to working with things that we can no longer remember the causal point of. So what it can do, for example, because the presence in me is the same as the presence in you, when I invite presence to facilitate me and say, lead me back into this moment, lead me back into authenticity, lead me back into awareness, what's keeping me from being authentic and staying in this moment are unintegrated memories that I don't even know about. So it can bring my attention to those emotional resonances by operating it near anyone around me to trigger me into remembering. So it can get you to walk into the room and say something that you're completely unaware of what you're doing that reminds me of something my mother said a long time ago that really upset me and made me angry. And you say that in front of me and I get all angry. And I think that you're doing it. And I go to you, why did you say that? What, what, what right do you have? And you go, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> You've had that experience, right? So presence can use anybody and anything, anything of this world. It created everything. It's part of that which created everything. It can use the sound of a car. It can use a radio that you're listening to. It can use anything to trigger you into remembering something. And remember that the memory that we are working with isn't the physical event or the story we tell ourselves about it. The memory is the emotional resonance that we are feeling when we are being triggered, the energy that we are feeling. That's what's being brought up. So it has an ability to do that, and it does it to us all the time. The presence within us, being the presence in everything and everywhere, by aligning ourselves with that and by becoming more aware of that, also automatically begins to bring us into what we think of as unity consciousness. Once we align ourselves with that, with something we all share, it changes our way of being in the world as well. Also, presence doesn't interfere, and the word interfere means to interfere. So when I go, you know, let me give you my advice on the situation. Let me tell you what I think is going on here. And you haven't even asked for it. That's called interference. And the only reason I'm doing that is because I think that something you do can affect my experience in an uncomfortable way. And I'm going to stop that before it even happens. Because I don't yet believe that I'm responsible for my own experience. And if I honestly don't believe I'm responsible for my own experience, then I don't believe you're responsible for yours. And therefore, I'm just going to go around interfering with everybody, giving my advice. Advice is a great word. Add vice. Add a vice. Okay. <laughs> Let me add another vice to your life. Okay. <laughs> vice. Even though this breathing is a very simple thing, it's just breathing in and out. Do we need to take a toilet break or something? Because everyone's. <laughs> You know, the bladder is directly related to the emotional body. <laughs> it really is. You know, the first time we didn't control anything and had to control it and lost control of it and felt really ashamed about it was bladder as children. A lot of issues around. So there you go. Okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> Made us pissed off as children. <laughs> no, feel free, go. <laughs> Don't let us stop you. We won't analyze. <laughs> It's another good word, analyze. <laughs> okay, so when we start doing our breathing practice, what we will find is that we'll go into experiences of resistance. I'm really, what I'm doing is I'm sitting down for 15 minutes twice a day and going... But you know what? I will find a lot of things I need to do before that. <laughs> There's just a lot of stuff that I need to get done before I can sit down and breathe for 15 minutes. And I can do all sorts of stuff that is just meaningless and drives me crazy. But when I come to the end of the day, oh, it's really hard. I can't do my breathing at the end of the day. It's so tiring. I get people ask me, but it's really hard to breathe for 15 minutes before I go to bed. It's really hard. It's really hard to get up in the morning and, and do something for myself, like breathe. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much else that I need to do. But the resistance is always a key. If we're at war and we've been advancing to such a point that we are now behind the enemy lines and we get lost and we run out of ammunition and we run out of food, our only hope is to link up with the resistance movement. Because the resistance movement, even though they look like the enemy, speak like the enemy, use the same weapons as the perceived enemy, the fact is the resistance movement are not the enemy. They're the resistance movement. 
and they have stashes of food all over the place, stashes of ammo, safe places to hide, and they know, mainly what they know, is how to get us back to a safe territory. So whenever we're doing emotional or processing work, any of this sort of work, and resistance comes up, well, join up with that resistance movement and head right in that direction. You know you're on the right track. When the resistance comes up, we are on the right track. It's one of the, the signs. One of the reasons that breathing twice a day is challenging for us because it may well be the first thing we've ever done for ourselves in our whole life. Now we think we're doing stuff for ourselves. No, I got myself a gym membership, really. <laughs> I got a gym. But take away all the people in your life and you'll find there's no reason to go to gym, huh? There's no one to look good for anymore. So a lot of our behavior is reactive. We're doing it because, we're doing it because of somebody else or some external thing that is supporting that. You take that external support away and we don't have the will to do it because we've never developed our will, our personal will. I brushed my teeth because I was told to, I ate my food because I was told to, I bought the clothes that were given to me, or I wore the clothes that were bought for me and chosen for me. Everything was being done from the outside. So I never learned to develop the muscles of doing something from the inside. So what I do is now I'm going to do this breathing, right? Because I want to do this for myself. So I sit down and I do the breathing. But there's something missing. So it's hard for me to keep going and I struggle with it. And you know what's really missing? There's no one to come up and go, Hey, good breathing. <laughs> Great. I love that last turn in the last five minutes. Good form there. <laughs> okay. There's no one to do that. Because if you go to somebody and go, you walk into the office, I did my breathing this morning. <laughs> they go, okay. Have you seen the counselor about that? <laughs> and if you tell people, I'm doing this great course, what is it? Breathing. <laughs> You're not doing that already? That... <laughs> so the universe is not going to support you in this work. It's going to mock you when you try and look for support. Because the whole thing about this work is, it's about emotionally growing up. And emotionally growing up is about learning how to give to myself what it is I've been seeking from the world. And you can bet that presence is not going to let you get away with one bit. Every time you run looking for validation for doing this work, which is an addiction, for acknowledgement, someone will say something really to you that will make you feel ridiculous. You're doing your breathing, really. Huh? Well, so when you look for that, you will find out how that works. So the resistance comes because nobody is there in the morning watching me breathe and never do your breathing in front of somebody else. This is our inner work. It's like the best when you see someone meditating in front of other people. Look at me in my divine posture. <laughs> One with the universe. <laughs> and what was that thing I was supposed to be doing at the office? Uh, what is that thing that person said? Oh, yeah, I'm one with the universe. Look at me. I'm... Okay, we don't want to get into that. That's our inner work. The breathing technique itself is very simple. It's so simple that it's hard for us to get it because we're so used to going and breathing. Okay, this is the breathing course. <sighs> Whatever the things we do when we go into breathing stuff. But what we really want to do with this is breathe normally, which is a new experience for many of us. But it's about the connection between the in-breath and the out-breath, about not pausing between the in-breath and the out-breath. And it's advised that we only breathe through our nose, in through the nose, out through the nose. Because a different amount of oxygen goes in through the nose, then goes in through the mouth. So if I breathe through my, in through my nose and out through my mouth, there's going to be an eventually an imbalance happening. If I breathe in through my mouth and out through my nose, there's going to be an imbalance happening. So I want to stay in a balanced place. And it's very simple. The breathing is just like this. that for 15 minutes and see how that works for you. So you may get a little dizzy because suddenly there's more oxygen coming in. The dizziness will pass. The first few times you may get slightly dizzy. The dizziness will pass. Eventually you won't get dizzy at all. So let's have everyone do that for a few moments. And don't try. When people are playing in an orchestra, they're not trying to play music. They're just playing the music. So don't try. The thing about breathing is breathe loud enough so you can hear yourself. A 
often we struggle with breathing too because we're looking for an experience. I've been breathing, I don't have any experience. I don't have an experience. The breathing is not the experience. Our life is the experience. This is a tool to enhance our life experience. So don't go towards the breathing expecting to have an experience. We only do that when we're uncomfortable in our own life experience and looking for a way out of that. It's a practice. Every moment that we are connecting our breathing is a moment that we are anchoring ourselves in the domain of our inner presence. And it knows no order of difficulty and it begins to work on us immediately. Immediately. It's a causal practice. Because it's a causal practice, it's making adjustments in our emotional body. And until we have emotional body awareness, we may not understand what those adjustments are initially. But we will see the effect of them in our life experience. So in the book, it's suggested that after we do our 15 minutes breathing, that we sit for a few moments in the quietness and the stillness. And this is a very important part of it. There's a trinity that makes up our experience of this world, of this world that we're in. And the trinity is movement, sound, and form. Movement, sound, and form. And what we do is that we are continually attaching our attention to movement, sound, and form. All day, that's what we do. The thing about movement and sound and form and uh, when we get into spiritual stuff, we go, oh, this world's not real. Not real. None of it's real. Well, if I come and hit you over the head with a club, you will know just how real this world is. Okay, this world is real. So again, that me messes with our intention when we say this world isn't real. This world is very real. What it's not is permanent. So it's more accurate to say this world is not permanent. Then we can work with that. Okay. And the reason why it's not permanent is because all sound, all movement, and all form come out of silence stillness and invisibility that's the trinity of what we could think of as permanent stillness silence and invisibility is permanent if I left this right here this book everything right here come back in a few thousand years it will not be here it's not permanent the sound of this air conditioner which is not working <laughs> as you see is not permanent <laughs> it went back into stillness <laughs> And we're having to deal with what's permanent now. <laughs> so everything that has movement, sound, and form will always come out of and re-enter silence, stillness, and invisibility. Now, if we spend all our time in this world attaching all our attention and awareness to movement, form, and sound, what happens to our awareness when we leave this particular experience we're having? We lose it all. We've attached it to something that's absolutely impermanent. So if you want to know a reason why you can't remember your past lives, because in our past lives we attached ourselves to everything that was impermanent and therefore our awareness is gone of that. So it's very important to at some point in the experience start attaching our attention and our awareness to silence, to stillness and to invisibility. And the way that we begin doing that is by sitting still, being quiet, and doing that in front of nobody else. That's the invisibility part. That's my inner work. And the moment I show my inner work to you, it belongs to the world. And the world is the grim reaper because everything in the world is impermanent. It will at some point go through some sort of death experience. So when I sit after my breathing for just a few minutes and in the silence, in the stillness, on my own, I'm starting to develop a relationship with that which is permanent, with that which is real. And because I have no relationship with that, it has no meaning to me initially. I have no even way of gauging that because the world doesn't support such a relationship. The world will only support a relationship with that which is impermanent. That's the world's job. In other words, if we're going to have a relationship with what's real, that must come from ourselves too, just like emotional growth. And that is the authentic purpose of what we call meditation. Meditation in the Christian text, it speaks about the rock and the sand. Are you building your house on rock or are you building your house on sand? Because sand is everything that will be washed away by the winds and tides of time. The rock is that which is permanent. And the doorway to the rock is silence stillness and invisibility don't even show your right hand what your left hand is doing if you're doing inner work in other words don't show the world your stuff when you're doing that this between you and yourself and whatever your creator is that will be permanent whatever you invest into that you will take with you forever 
So somebody asked a question just now about the breathing, saying, but you really breathe fast. So there's a reason for that. When we do breathing like that, remember that breathing is a magnifying glass through which our intentions are magnified. Think of it in that way. So different people with different intentions use breathing in different ways. So if we're in a meditative practice, we may use long, deep breathing. Here we're in a practice in which we are intending to process our unconsciousness. And when that unconsciousness starts to come to the surface, it comes as a severe sense of tiredness that can cause us to enter a state of sleep before we're even aware it's going on. So as you're breathing, what will happen is you will start to entertain a particular thought and then it'll go into a thought stream. And as you travel along that thought stream, you will go into back into the mental plane. You will leave the body. And what that will look like, it looks like initially that you go asleep while you're breathing. You'll find you'll suddenly become aware that you were seemingly asleep. If you're not asleep, you've just left the body. So when the breathing is at a higher tempo, what it does is it sort of assists us when that comes up. And in fact, when that unconsciousness comes up, you will find that where you're slipping out is at the end of the outbreath. So at the end of the outbreath, you'll just be gone. Boom. So one thing that helps with that and to, to cut down on the pausing, because we all pause to some extent between the breaths, there is a pause that's happening there. To cut down on that, we just increase the tempo of our breathing slightly. When the breathing really takes over, once we get into it, and we really will take our attention off it, it'll just run by itself. You will go into a breathing pattern, but initially we have to consciously work with it. So the higher tempo, also remember that the, the fear and the anger and the grief, these energies that we're working with, we can think of them as low frequency energies. And the breathing at a higher tempo increases our overall frequency. You will know that because your thoughts will start going all over the place. If we want to know what our frequency is, we don't have to get cosmic about it. Our frequency is what we most frequently think about, what we most frequently think about. That's our frequency being reflected mentally from the emotional body. The presence activation statement in session two is I acknowledge my reflections in the world. So let's look at memory in terms of emotional processing because when we live in a time-based paradigm, we think of memory as thoughts and images that come up in our mental or our, we can even think our mind's eye. Internally, we have these pictures come up. Oh, I'm remembering something. But the memories that we're working with, that we're wanting to process, have no concepts around them. And that's why if we go to a therapist, for example, and they ask us to talk about our childhood, and obviously we're paying for it, we need to say something. So we start talking about our childhood. And what we do is we start telling stories about our childhood, which are really going to be interpretations. And interpretation is always the doorway to misinterpretation. And then after doing that for a couple of years, now we have the story I have to deal with that I now believe. So we don't want to go there with this work. If we ask questions about that period of our life, as we'll see as we go on, it's really not about the information that's there. It's about moving energy along the pathway of awareness back into ourselves, back into our emotional body. So the core memories are actually energy experiences, energetic emotional experiences that happened to us before we had any concepts about it. So, for example, only an adult can have a happy childhood. <laughs> okay, I had a happy childhood. When I say I had a happy childhood, what I mean is I have successfully removed the memory of everything that was uncomfortable to me to the point that I can only remember things that were comfortable. Now I've had a happy childhood. Happiness is an adult concept. Children don't think in terms of happiness. So when our memories come up, some do come up as images and insights, those that are useful to us. But when we're working with our inner presence, the way these memories are going to come up and the way that they have always come up is as people's behaviors and physical circumstances around us that cause us to become upset. Whenever I'm getting upset by anything that's happening in my world, it's because I'm remembering something. Now, it's hard for us to see that because we are so transfixed by the physical world. So how can something that this person has just said to me be a memory? Because they're saying it now. Okay, the memory is not the physical event, and the memory is not the story I tell myself about it, which I'm addicted to doing. The memory is the emotional signature underneath. So when we ask to be facilitated by our inner presence, it is going to deliberately, and the word deliberate has the word liberate in it, it's going to deliberately bring up the memories that we need to work with. And those are going to come as us being upset by what's happening around us. 
Now, what we normally do when we get upset by what's happening around us is we react and project ourselves outwards. And that's when we add into it. We add more stuff, more, more drama into our experience. So, for example, when I say I acknowledge my reflections in the world, what I'm talking about is if you come into the room and start behaving around me like my mother, and say so I haven't dealt with my issues around my mother, you come in and you behave like my mother. The moment I, I go, you're behaving like my mother, I'm not seeing you anymore. I've stopped seeing you. I've stopped seeing what's real in front of me. I'm now seeing a reflection. And the moment I start behaving around you like I behaved around my mother, I'm now projecting. So most of us are living in a state of reflection and projection. In other words, what we're doing is we're driving our car, but we're navigating by looking in the rearview mirror and wondering why we keep crashing into everything. Okay. So what we want to do is to start identifying the memories that are coming up so that we can stop reacting to them and start responding to them. So the person bringing the memory to us is a messenger. They don't even know they're carrying the message because presence is working inside of them to do this because we've asked to be facilitated. But what I like to do is when the messenger appears, I like to take up my shotgun <laughs> and shoot the messenger. It's the same as the male person coming to the door and bringing me a bill, and I open the bill, and it's a horrendous bill, and I start screaming at the male person. It's also the same as going to the mirror and looking and seeing that I've got pimples, and then I start cleaning the mirror. It's called ineffectual behavior. So the first thing we want to do is to start recognizing the messengers. And in that way, when I can recognize the messenger, when I can get into messenger, and messenger is also an interesting word like mess ender. The one comes to help us to end the mess. And usually the greatest messengers are the ones that love us the most. They love us enough to have enough courage to bring our stuff and show it to us. So presence will use people that are really close to us. They're our clearest mirrors. But if I get upset by anything, you can be sure it's my stuff, no matter how it looks on the outside world. Because if I do not have anger in me, you cannot make me angry. And if I do not have fear in me, you cannot make me scared. And if I do not have grief in me, you cannot make me grieve. So if I'm getting angry with you, it's my anger I'm feeling. It's got nothing to do with what's going on outside. You're just reflecting it for me. Because I can't see those memories, I have no insight. Insight requires that I see with the eyes of the emotional body. Okay, so physically we can be connected and physically we can be separate. I can move away from you. Mentally we can be connected, we agree on something and mentally we can be separated. But emotionally, as far as energy and motion is concerned, no one is separated from anyone <coughs> in this world. And emotions, to be able to see energies in motion and, and to be able to see my own energies in motion, which are causing these experiences to be reflected outside of me, be able to see the connection between what's going on in my heart and the reflection happening in the world requires that I have insight. I can see inside my own heart. Until I have insight, everything appears to be happening outside. So the first thing we want to do is to be able to discern between what's really going on and what's really not going on. When I get upset, what's really not going on is that that person is actually trying to do something to me. That's the illusion. What's really going on is that the universe is trying to bring something to my attention, an emotional dysfunction in my own being that I can no longer see so that I can work with it. Memory is also a recurring pattern. So we're going to look a little bit about memory here. Memory is also a recurring pattern. And that's why we'll say, I don't know why this keeps happening to me. I go to this job, I do my best, but the boss picks on me. It always happens wherever I go. These bosses are useless in this world. Can't find a good boss in this world. Okay, it always keeps happening because that boss is always reflecting my relationship with my father in the past. who used to pick on me as a child, and I have an unresolved memory of that. And it keeps repeating over and over and over until I resolve it. And memories come in a pattern. For a moment, let's sit and connect our breathing. Close the eyes so you can have some insight. Take your attention off the outside and bring to awareness that emotional upset that happened recently that we spoke about when we entered this journey together today. And all that you are required to do is look at that and be prepared, even though emotionally it might be difficult, but be prepared to look at that event or that behavior or that circumstance as having been a messenger that was trying to bring something to your attention. As simple as that. See the messenger. 
Okay, open your eyes, come back. It's not hard, it's no, no effort here. We're so used to trying to do things, like really gonna try and do, no, no. The less effort we put onto something like that, the quicker it's going to work for us. You'll find that in your life, the things that you thought about effortlessly, you put your attention on that effortlessly, next moment they happened. Effort is really not that necessary. But just see it as a messenger that's already doing something to that experience. It's already transforming it. So when we go to session three, session three is I respond consciously to all my experiences. I respond consciously to all my experiences. So instead of shooting the messenger, what I want to do is access information from this encounter. Now initially, this requires dismissing the messenger, which at some point of our awareness, when we gain more emotional strength and maturity, when we get upset, someone really upsets us, we will be able to go, thank you very much. <laughs> what a beautiful encounter. I now need you to move out of my space so I can have a little quiet time to go and work on my stuff, okay? <laughs> Which initially it's very hard to do because we're standing there with the shotgun in our hand going, I just want to... But it takes growing awareness and accumulating of present moment awareness. But what we really want to do is access information about this encounter, if it's available. But also what we want to do is to start working with the pathway of awareness. So the messenger, the event that upset us, is a physical circumstance. It's about the physical experience. Now we want to go along the pathway of awareness and move into the mental, start getting that moving, which is to bring it more towards us from the physical world. And so there's some questions that we ask ourselves in this part of the process. And remember, it's not about the answers, it's about the question. And just by asking these questions of ourselves, without placing a self-limiting judgment on our inability to get the answer, will allow that energy to start moving and working within us. And the answers, if it's necessary for us to know them, will come as our experience in some way, we'll, when we least expect it, will happen. But it's really not about the answers, it's about getting the energy which we've been projecting out into the world through our reactive behavior. We want to turn that energy around and start bringing it back into ourselves to where the causal point of the experience is so we can begin to adjust that. We can say, now I'm upset, but how am I feeling? What am I feeling? I mean, there's only three things. We can get all complicated. I'm feeling like I was left alone and then betrayed and let down, you know, go there, okay, which is where we go when we're all mental. But really, I'm either feeling afraid, or I'm feeling angry, or I'm feeling sad. No, I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated. No, frustrated is going to be anger. Oh, no, I feel anxiety. Oh, no, that's fear. Oh, I feel alone. Okay, no, that's sadness. Whatever. But underneath it, what is the feeling? The word that a child would use, because we're dealing with our child, our inner child, our heart center. What word would we as a child use? I'm scared. I'm angry. I'm cross. I'm sad. The moment we're doing that, we're already taking our attention off what's going on out there and putting it in here. It's an immediate movement of the energy internal. Then we can ask ourselves a question, when last did I feel the same emotional reaction? When last did I feel the same emotional reaction? Which is going to start allowing me to become aware that what's happening in this moment is really not about now because it already happened before. <coughs> and then we can ask a question, and when before that did I feel the same emotional reaction? And by asking that question, I'll start to become aware that not only is this not about now and that it's happened before, but this is a pattern. It's a pattern, bringing consciousness to what's happening to me, awareness to what's actually happening to me. And then we can ask a question, who does this behavior, this behavior that upset me, who does this behavior remind me of? And it may initially remind me of my wife or my husband, but actually, if we allow it to go back, we'll see that our re recent relationships, this behavior was in there too may remind me of people that I was involved with in the past. And if I allow it to go back, I'll see that it eventually reminds me of my mother and father, not necessarily how they behave towards me, but maybe how they behave towards each other. Or we can ask the question, who used to behave like this around me? Who used to behave like this around me? And whether the answer comes or not doesn't matter, because what that's going to do is it's going to send the energy back. There is no past behind us, by the way, so it's a past is within us, so it sends the energy within us towards the causal point. And those causal points start getting activated even if we're not aware of them or not because they're in the emotional body and we may not yet have accumulated any emotional body awareness. But if we have some emotional body awareness, if we can feel, we will start to feel things moving around.
Initially, we may feel them moving around physically as physical circumstances around us that start moving around or as thought processes that start to come. It doesn't matter. We ask the question and we allow the energy to do the work. So again, go to that upset that we now can allow ourselves to begin looking at and saying, well, this was a messenger, it was bringing me something. But now I would like to access information. I would also like to begin traveling down the pathway of awareness into myself so I can start to gain access to the causal point of this and make changes to it there. So when we think of that upset, let's first ask ourselves, how did this make me feel? Did it make me feel angry? Did it make me feel sad? Did it make me feel afraid? Or is it a combination of those? Because it can be more than one of those. It can be all three. It is actually all three if we can go deep into it. If it made us feel afraid, if we sink down into that fear, we'll find there's anger underneath it. If we sink down into the anger, we'll find that there's deep sadness there. So how did it make me feel? Then we can ask, when last did I experience an emotional reaction like this in my life? When last did something happen that made me feel this way? And then I can ask, and when before that did something happen that made me feel this way? So I can bring to consciousness, to awareness, that this is a pattern, a recurring event. Then I can ask myself, this upsetting behavior that made me feel this uncomfortable emotional feeling, who does this remind me of? Who used to behave around me like this and make me feel this way? And this enables me to establish that what appears to be happening now is actually sourced in something that happened in what I would call my past and that it's just being reflected in this moment to me so I can work with it. Therefore, the presence activation statement for session three, I respond consciously to all my experiences. By asking these questions, I'm no longer reacting. I'm now beginning to respond consciously So the questions are asked. If the answer's not there, that's fine. Just go to the next question. Our task is to sit in the question, in the causal point. When we enter session four, our present activation statement is, I restore my inner balance with my compassionate attention. I restore my inner balance with my compassionate attention. Remember the the demonstration of me standing up with my eyes closed and falling forward and going into an experience of severe discomfort because I could not feel I was out of balance. In other words, without feeling, I went out of balance. Now I want to begin working with that state of imbalance through my compassionate attention, which requires that I look at what the word compassion means. Compassion. Compassion is not sympathy. Oh, I'm, I'm here to help you out because I'm a compassionate person. I'm here to sympathize with what you're going through because I'm a compassionate person. I'm very concerned about you, you know, because I'm a compassionate person. Well, none of those things are compassion. That's called projection. Usually if I'm running around trying to help everybody, it's because I'm feeling so helpless. And I'm projecting my helplessness on the world around me. And instead of dealing with that emotional condition within myself, I'm trying to fix it by cleaning the mirror. So compassion is something different. Compassion is the knowing that I am responsible for my thoughts, words, and deeds. And that my thoughts, words, and deeds are what is initiating my experience. And that I'm always standing right in the center of the consequences of my thoughts, words, and deeds. Everywhere I go. And when I know that, then I know that about you too. Then I'm not going to interfere with what you're going through. Because by interfering, what I'm saying is, interfering is to go into fear. What I'm saying is that what you do to me, and therefore I better control what you're doing on some level so that I don't get affected by it. That's why I normally go and give advice. But if I know that I am responsible for my own thoughts, words, and deeds, and my thoughts, words, and deeds are what is manifesting the experience that I'm in, then I know, too, that the greatest suffering that is happening in the world is not the drama. The drama is not the suffering. Pain, the anger, the grief, that's not the suffering going on in the world. The suffering is not knowing that, because if I don't know I'm responsible for my own experience, there's not much I can do about it then. And then I think that freedom is to have no responsibility. I just want no responsibilities so I can be free. If I just had no responsibilities, I would be free. That's where I go. Freedom and responsibility are the same word. When I'm fully responsible, when I take full responsibility for my experience, I'm free. The moment I wait for you to change so that I can be at peace, it's over. It's not going to happen. Because I'm going to continually reflect on you what I think needs to be changed, what's supposed to be changed about myself, my own experience on you. So it's never going to happen. It's a catch-22. So compassion is not a doing. 
when I know that I'm responsible for my own thoughts, words, and deeds, and that these are manifesting my experience, and I know the same for you, then when you're going through something, I know that what you're going through is a teaching for you. And if it's really rough, that's what it's going to take to bring attention to what's going on with you. It's going to bring attention to your level of responsibility, whether you want to look for that or not. And so while you go through it, I'm happy to be with you. I'm happy to be with you while you go through that. If you ask for my assistance, I can share my experience, but I will not give you my advice if you don't ask for it. That's sympathy, concern, fear, judgment, assumption, interpretation. Compassion is I will be with you while you go through that. You can come to me and I will allow you to pass on. Come, pass on, compassion. And I will not interfere with what's going on with you. I will honor your journey and I will honor your right to figure it out yourself. But I cannot be that way with you unless I can be that way with myself. Okay, so unless I can be that way with myself. When we have pain and discomfort, by example, through being indoctrinated into our own reactive behavior, we always react to pain and discomfort. Always. So if I'm in pain and discomfort, the mind goes wrong, bad, stop, and I'll go to somebody and try and get them to stop it. Stop it, sedate it, drug it, cut it out, because I believe something wrong is happening. But actually what pain and discomfort is, especially pain in the body, it's the body going, please come back in here. Really, you're supposed to live in here while you're here and be part of running this beautiful organic machinery that you, the life, is what makes it alive. You have reached the end of track one. Please go to track two.